systematic way, having the property that if you have an array of fibers, and this array can be illustrated here, which can transmit light to a head, and you can notice that as I move the various fibers across the light source, different portions of the head are illuminated. Now you can picture a situation where this code plate is attached to a moving element and the code plate is then moved past the head and that determines which ones of the mating fibers receive light and with the reception of light there's an indication of the position of the code plate. This is boron a carbon fiber composite, which can be cut to a pattern like a tailor-made suit. A computer has drawn and numbered each pattern. Composites come in many types, each with a special property. By crisscrossing them according to a predetermined plan, a helicopter fuselage can be built. But if those optical fibers were interwoven with these composites, the need to bundle cables of any sort from cockpit to computer would vanish. So it's become quite realistic to imagine a helicopter with the fiber optic controls built into the composite fuselage, flown with one hand using a sidearm control with voice commanded displays projected directly onto the pilot's eyeglasses. Such a machine would be very strong. This composite cockpit is free-falling from 40 feet. An impact that often crushed both helicopter and passengers in Vietnam. If the crash was from a greater height, the helicopter of the future might even offer an escape route. First, the blade roots have to be cut with explosive bolts in sequence, so as not to unbalance the helicopter. Then, all this is in slow motion, the navigator and engineer are pulled from their seats and hauled skyward behind small rockets. Once they've cleared the now rotorless machine, the pilot pulls his eject lever and is dragged vertically through the observation canopy. Clearly, synchronizing such an event would be crucial and under battle conditions, virtually impossible. Perhaps to the relief of pilots, the idea has been shelved for now. Like any machine, a helicopter can go wrong and crash. The most catastrophic failure is the loss of the tail rotor. Without it, the fuselage becomes uncontrollable. The loss of the tail rotor is what the US Army would call a zero survivability situation. And in this film, the disastrous consequences are graphically shown. The marks on the film are from the fire that followed the crash. A television crew was taking aerial shots of Sydney when a tail rotor blade sheared off. The helicopter fuselage rotates uncontrollably as the engine spins it against the direction of the main rotor. Another cameraman was filming the same stricken helicopter. Arthur Young's earliest experiments were with talkless rotors. Small propellers on the blade tips put the rotor drive outside the fuselage, removing the need for a tail rotor. 
Ten years later, in California, Howard Hughes turned to the idea of torqueless rotors. His worked not with propellers, but with jet thrusters in the tips, which again kept the mechanical torque outside the fuselage. As with all Hughes' ideas, it was bigger than anyone else's. The huge rotor turned at a lazy 90 revs. Another version took thrust from fuselage-mounted jet engines up through the hub of the rotor and out through the tips of the blades, achieving the same result. But it was too costly and complex to work in the field. Today, all single rotor helicopters have tail rotors of some kind, except this one. It's called the no tail rotor, or NOTAR for short. It's based on a conventional helicopter, but the tail boom is much thicker than on a normal machine of this size. The tail is hollow, and a fan sucks air through the mesh grill behind the cockpit and down the inside of the boom to the tail. A cap on the end of the boom can be rotated by the pilot's foot pedal controls. This cap has a slot in it which mates up with another in the tail, so the rotating action makes the combined aperture larger or smaller, depending on the sideways thrust required. The jet engine exhaust is also angled for additional thrust. During slow maneuvers, or in a hover, a more constant anti-torque thrust is provided by another slot that runs the length of the tail between the two ring-like baffles. This uses a phenomenon called the coander effect. The coander effect will turn the cylindrical tail into a wing, and wings work by forcing air to travel faster over the top of their surface than underneath. This makes the pressure on the top surface drop so the wing flies. If we could turn a wing on its side, air passing over the surfaces would make it move right. The coander principle achieves the same effect by blowing air out of the slot. Downwash from the helicopter blade travels over the cylindrical boom, but air leaving the slot makes the downwash stick to the tail for longer on the right than on the left, in effect producing an aerofoil so the tail moves right against the torque of the blades. All this is fine in theory, but putting it into practice is proving more difficult than the designers had expected. If the idea can be made to work reliably, it might be possible to remove the tail rotor from conventional helicopters. But the main rotor still remains a problem because it limits the speed of a helicopter in forward flight. During the 1960s and early 70s, all the major companies tried to find ways of making helicopters fly faster. The most common solution was the compound helicopter. It was nothing more than a conventional machine with jets added for higher forward speed and wings to increase the lift. These compounds were quite fast. This one managed well over 200 miles an hour, and researchers found that the rotors could be slowed down at higher speeds, leaving the stubby wings to provide the lift. But speed gained this way costs fuel, and during the 70s, fuel costs killed off this approach to the problem. The rotor itself has always been the real barrier. When hovering, the blades generate equal lift throughout all 360 degrees. But when the helicopter moves forward, this changes. The advancing blade at the top of the picture attacks the air faster because the forward speed of the helicopter is added to its rotational speed. For the retreating blade at the bottom of the picture, the reverse happens and it loses lift. This means that if the tips of the blades are traveling at 100 miles an hour and the helicopter moves forward at 100 miles an hour, 
the advancing blade is now hitting the air at 200 miles an hour and the retreating blade is effectively standing still. The advancing blade would be generating 100% more lift than the retreating blade, which would have stalled long ago, which of course limits the speed at which the helicopter can fly. The advancing blade tip can go almost supersonic under some high-speed conditions, and the slowing of the blades on these compound helicopters was one way of overcoming this. But there is one avenue of development that all helicopter engineers have known about, contra-rotating blades. At Sikorsky, wind tunnel work has shown that a machine with this configuration could have slower rotor speeds and obtain lift on both the advancing blades. It was known as the ABC. Project manager, Art Linden. The concept of the, of the ABC, the advancing blade concept, was known in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, the problem was, in those days, we were building rotor blades out of, out of wood, fabric, that kind of thing. Uh, by the 50s, we were building rotor blades out of aluminum and steel, but we still did not have the materials which gave us the very high strength and very light weight that we needed with this type of a very stiff, strong, rigid rotor system. Uh, now, we've really passed the stage of using titanium technology, and we'd build a rotor system if we were to build a new one out of advanced composites, which would be very easy. Uh, it's really the ABC was a concept waiting for the materials technology, and now the materials technology is here. The ABC has been a long time coming, 10 years in all. This is Byron Graham's last year as Sikorsky's chief experimental test pilot. At 60, he's a veteran of the Pacific War and one of the last of the old crew cut school from the piston engine days. Sternal power on, all switches set, and all circuit breakers in. Okay, start the board. Graham has done every development flight in the ABC, and now trains younger men to fly this prototype. But the ABC refuses to take off in the minds of either military or civil customers. On the face of it, the machine is ideal. Its small rotors make it neat and compact. It needs no tail rotor because the main rotors counter-rotate, cancelling torque reaction and the rigid blades can react more quickly to pilot control. But most important, it is very fast. With a top speed of over 250 miles an hour, it will outperform any conventional helicopter. But it was a very unconventional machine that struggled to overcome all the problems posed by helicopters. Called the XV-3 tilt rotor, it could convert itself into an ordinary aeroplane by swinging its engine pylons into a horizontal position the small wings providing the necessary lift for forward flight. These early versions, built in the 50s, suffered from vibration caused by primitive rotors and piston engines. Jet engines and composite rotors enabled the designers to refine the configuration into this, the XV-15. Some designers believe that this configuration betrays the original conception of the helicopter, but there's no doubt that it's beginning to work. All the controls feed into the semi-rigid rotor blades, which can alter their pitch collectively and cyclically, just like a normal helicopter.
Once a forward speed of about 80 miles an hour is reached, the wings begin to take over the lift, and the engines can be tilted completely horizontal, propelling the machine to around 300 miles an hour. Maybe the shape of things to come was not a helicopter for every man after all, but just a plane that could take off vertically. Or a helicopter that learned to fly like a plane. The dream shown uh, in the popular magazines in the 1920s and 30s has never been fulfilled. The idea there was this will be like the family car and you will go out and step into the machine and go uh, wherever you have them uh, hankering to go uh, on just minor errands. Certainly, I think that dream will never be fulfilled because of the terrifying traffic problems in the sky. Uh, as far as the actual utility of the machine, both military and civilian, is concerned, I think what has happened has far exceeded the dreams that we had. Certainly in the 40s, when Arthur Young and uh, Igor Sikorsky and Fokker and Flettner, also in Germany, by the way, were uh, building experimental machines. I think it's a little bit like giving birth to a child. You have no idea what the child is going to be. You may dream that it'll be a mathematician when it grows up, or a ballet dancer, or what have you. Uh, and when the child grows up only to be a real estate salesman, let's say, uh, was the dream fulfilled or not? I, I don't know what to say, but the person certainly became a person. And the helicopter has become a, a machine which is part of our life and which can do many more jobs than we thought of back in the 1940s.